Thank you, Andrew. And it, it's true. I, I think the very first environmental history meeting I went to, I heard Andrew speak, and I thought it was fantastic, and I have really enjoyed knowing him all these years. And I see a couple of other old friends here as well. Jenny Price, who's visiting at Washington University. And I can't help giving also a shout out to my nephew, Seth Feldman, who came to school here and stayed to start a small business. And uh, it's a delight to be in, in his town, in your town. Uh, and thanks to Steve and Nick and Emily and everyone else who made this possible. Um, Andrew didn't say one, one thing about me that uh, as I was thinking about what I was going to say, and this is also, this is the first time I've talked about Earth Day since um, November 2016. And I hadn't looked at my book actually uh, in that time. And so um, the book's changed in some ways for me as I've looked at it. But, but uh, what Andrew didn't say is that I, I have a uh, split personality as a historian. Uh, there's, there's two me's um, writing history. And uh, so one of them is Mr. Apocalypse. And um, uh, you, you can't be an environmental historian and not think all the time about how incredibly challenging are the environmental issues we face and uh, how much more we still need to do if we're going to build a sustainable future. And uh, Mr. Apocalypse's main mission is to try to understand why we have environmental problems and, and, and why some of them have been so difficult to solve. And so Mr. Apocalypse is always uh, speaking disturbing truths, truths that uh, are meant to be unsettling. Uh, hopefully they, 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 they make people want to act, but but um, pointing out problems, and, and especially when powerful interests often are, are uh, the villains, uh, that's an uncomfortable thing. Mr. Apocalypse, he's Mr. Doom. Um, but the other, the other Adam, uh, and I didn't really realize entirely this split personality until I was working on this book. So the other Adam I now call Dr. Earth Day. And uh, so Dr. Earth Day, looks at the history of our, um, at really uh, over uh, the last 150 years, increasing awareness of all the harm that we do to our environment and ultimately to ourselves. Uh, and, and the growing movement over 150 years, and especially in the last 50, uh, to wrestle with these problems, to, to think about pollution, to think about waste of resources, to think about destruction of of places of great natural beauty. And so uh, the stories that Dr. Earth Day tells often are heartening. Uh, they're, they're about people rallying, people working, uh, often against great odds to try to make a difference, to try to build a better future. And for most of my career, um, Mr. Apocalypse and Dr. Earth Day, uh, e even though they're opposites, uh, they, they have found a way to work together. Uh, so my first book, uh, The Bulldozer in the Countryside, uh, which is about how Americans first came to think of sprawl as an environmental problem and what they did. Uh, so one part of that book is, is the, the story of people gradually recognizing that we, uh, as we were building uh, mass-produced suburb after mass-produced suburb after World War II, uh, that that was causing a whole host of environmental problems. And, and some were quite immediate. Um, people uh, turning on their sink and having detergent foam come out because of uh, problems with their septic tanks, uh, or their houses sliding down hillsides because they, they were built places where they shouldn't have built, been built. Uh, and over the course of the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, um, one problem after another caused by suburban sprawl becomes a public issue, uh, and, and people begin to grapple with it. Uh, but they don't, they don't entirely deal with the problem, needless to say. Uh, and the book ends with a, a failure in the 1970s to, to pass a, a national land use law that would have regulated in many, many ways how people built and where they built uh, and, and would have grappled with many of the environmental problems. Uh, so sprawl, needless to say, 
it, it was around in 1970, it was around in 1980, it was around in 1990, it was around in 2000, and 2010, still today. So that book ends with uh, Mr. Apocalypse coming back into the picture and, and trying to analyze uh, why we hadn't been able to solve these problems. Uh, the book that I'm working on now is about uh, how business has dealt with environmental issues, especially since the late 1980s. Um, and so for the longest period of time, uh, business was the problem more than anything else. Not the only problem, but it was a big part of it. That the, the default way of doing business involved polluting the earth uh, and wasting resources um, or exploiting resources. And, um, but, but somewhat surprisingly, uh, in the last 30 years or so, uh, many, many businesses have become a lot more interested in sustainability. And, and uh, part of that is the legislation that comes in the 1970s forcing them to take action to deal with a variety of problems. But many businesses have gone beyond mere compliance with the law. And uh, um, they're doing more than they have to. Uh, and it's become important to a lot of investors, to a lot of consumers, uh, to a lot of employees. Uh, it's not just a matter of responding to regulation or even to uh, activist pressure. Uh, but needless to say, uh, we're still far, far, far from having a sustainable economy. Um, you could argue that a lot of what business has been doing is just reducing their unsustainability rather than um, genuinely transforming the way they do things. So there's a hopeful story there. There's the Dr. Earth Day story, and then there's the story about how much we still have to do and how challenging it's going to be to do what we need to do, which is the Mr. Apocalypse story. Uh, so the one exception uh, in my career, the one time when, when, when um, one side of me really won out over the other uh, was when I was writing about Earth Day itself, in the 1970 Earth Day, the very first Earth Day. Uh, and, and, and maybe that was because I, wasn't, I didn't plan to write that book. Um, I was in the middle of another book, and uh, you know, I guess um, you could say my Earth Day book was an unplanned pregnancy. All of a sudden, I woke up one day and I said, hmm, nobody has ever written a book about Earth Day. And uh, it's, it's a great story. And I like, I was a journalist for a while before I became a historian. So I've been looking for an opportunity to tell a great story. Uh, and and I, at, at first I, I tried not to do it. Uh, I had this other commitment to do, do this other project. Uh, but Earth Day wouldn't let go of me. I just, I, 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 I couldn't stop thinking about it. And, and then when I actually started to work on the book, even though I had always lectured about Earth Day, I, I realized the story was way, way, way more interesting, way, way more inspiring uh, than I had ever thought. And it was also more complicated. Uh, even the word Earth Day turns out to be partly a misnomer because a lot of places had events that lasted a whole week uh, or that lasted the whole spring leading up to the first Earth Day. Or, or they were uh, a little earlier than Earth Day. They didn't even include April 22nd. Um, but the, event, this, the story of Earth Day, the more I, I came to go beyond the superficial part of the story that I knew, which, which many people know, that, that the first Earth Day was, was a big deal. Uh, millions and millions of people celebrated it. It got tremendous uh, media attention. Um, and uh, politicians certainly took notice. Uh, so people often talk about it as the beginning of what became the environmental decade, the decade when the United States finally uh, passed aggressive national legislation to deal with water pollution and air pollution and hazardous waste and endangered species. Um, so uh, people knew that Earth Day made a difference, but they hadn't really thought about how or why other than that, that it was this incredibly powerful demonstration that Americans really cared more than anyone had realized about uh, environmental issues. But when I, when I looked at it, and I was also thinking about it as a modern American historian, uh, so Earth Day comes at the end of the 1960s, it's t this tumultuous decade of incredible social change and of uh, social movements taking center stage. Uh, and the Earth Day was really quite different than uh, the great events that ended the decade uh, in the anti-war movement or the civil rights movement. 
uh, or for that matter, the beginnings of the, of the modern feminist movement. Uh, that, you know, the March on Washington with Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, uh, that was the culmination of, of uh, a decade of activism just of Dr. King's, let alone uh, many, many other people. Um, the, uh, uh, the great environment, the great anti-war demonstration uh, at the end of the 60s, uh, again, was, was the culmination of a whole series of earlier uh, major protests. Uh, Earth Day wasn't that way at all. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more improbable the whole thing seemed to me, uh, that that was the first big surprise. And, and, and to, to suggest how improbable it is, you've got to go back just even one year, 1969. Uh, so, in 1969, no one even used the phrase, the environmental movement. There was no sense yet that there was a mass concern uh, that millions and millions of people shared. Um, there had been environmental activism of many, many kinds going back decades, and it had been accelerating. Uh, people concerned about sprawl, people concerned about pollution, people concerned about loss of wilderness. People worried about population exploding. Um, all these issues, people worried about uh, radioactive fallout from atomic bomb testing. Uh, all these issues had uh, energized some people, but um, what we would now think of the, as the environmental movement was fragmented. Uh, there, there wasn't a sense that all these people had something in common, that they, that they shared uh, a concern about one huge problem uh, by, by Earth Day, people were talking about the environmental crisis, and that was all-encompassing. That included all these problems. But no one even used the phrase environmental movement that I have been able to find until uh, December 1969, and the only uses of it even then were in stories about what was going to be the first Earth Day. So there, there was no sense yet of a unified national movement. Um, the environment itself was, was uh, uh, visibly... Um, a problem. Uh, many, many cities smoke from factories, uh, effluent from, s from sewer systems and from factories spewing into rivers and lakes. People were talking about the Great Lakes being dead. Um, 1969 opens with the first of what's unfortunately been a series of devastating uh, oil spills off a coast, this one in Santa Barbara. Uh, so people were uh, uh, beginning to think that some of these environmental problems were growing much worse, that many of our new technologies after the war were creating unprecedented problems. But uh, it wasn't a national issue. In 1968, in the presidential election, neither candidate talked about it. Uh, polls showed that a majority of Americans were concerned about pollution, but it wasn't one of their top priority issues. Uh, and as I say, the federal government had not yet done anything really bold to deal with environmental problems. And uh, the reason I, I, I focus on that is because if you were there in 1969 uh, and you were concerned about this, th these things, it might have seemed pretty hopeless. It might have seemed that um, people had been talking about this, some people at least, for a while, and yet nothing really serious was getting done. Uh, a year later, I don't think anyone would have had that feeling. And, and Earth Day is a huge part of, of what changed. Uh, and again, uh, a lot of people today, I think, feel uh, it's hard to see where the hope might be of dramatic improvement uh, in, in our uh, environmental situation, of, of really grappling seriously with the problems of sustainability. Uh, but I think Earth Day gives you, me the hope, at least, that you never know when things might change in ways you can't have foreseen. Uh, and they, they changed, in, in, again, in ways that, that struck me as incredibly improbable. Uh, so Earth Day becomes the greatest mass demonstration in American history. Millions and millions of people participated. Um, at the time, people estimated 20 million. And there were only about 160, 170 million people in the United States. So, so one out of eight, maybe. I think that's a little exaggerated. I don't think it was quite that many. Um, but it was certainly in the, in the 10 plus million range and maybe, maybe quite a bit more. Um, so a stunningly large number of people participate in some way in, in Earth Day. Uh, but it started in, in the most unlikeliest way. Um, 
a senator from Wisconsin, Gaylord Nelson, uh, a Democrat, gave a speech in Seattle uh, in September 1969 in which he promised to uh, sponsor what he called a nationwide environmental teach-in uh, the next spring. So he, didn't, he didn't, wasn't even calling it Earth Day. Uh, a nationwide environmental teach-in. And the, the teach-in was a, a tactic that the environmental, uh, the anti-war movement had used and then rejected uh, after a few years. But they began these teach-ins uh, as essentially highly politicized extracurricular educational events on college campuses where people would get together to talk about whether the war in Vietnam was a good thing or a bad thing. It was organized by the people who thought it was a mistake and they were confident that if, if they had a real debate about it, they would win and that would motivate people to do something. Uh, and Gaylord Nelson had, had heard about this and uh, thought it might, might break the logjam on environmental issues if something similar happened. But, but his initial hope was to only have maybe 40 events uh, around the country. He didn't dream of Earth Day becoming what it became. Ultimately, there were maybe 12, 13,000 events around the country. Basically, every college, uh, almost every K-12 to school, and hundreds or thousands of other community uh, events took place in April 1970. Um, and uh, the events themselves were astonishingly varied, and a lot of them were way, way more powerful than I had imagined. The, the usual story about Earth Day before focused on the, the symbolic parts of the day, the ways in which people, uh, uh, you know, they would wear gas masks to suggest that the future might be one where the air was unbreathable, or they would uh, throw fish in the ponds in front of corporations that were polluting rivers, uh, or they take um, automobiles, this happened more than once, it's kind of amazing, uh, they'd, they'd get an old car and they would uh, bury it or they would hack it up and destroy it or they put it on trial in one place and they, they find it, found it guilty of crimes against the environment. So there were all these symbolic ways in which people protested pollution. Uh, but that turned out, as I discovered, to be only a small part of what Earth Day was. Uh, and, and Earth Day wasn't just celebrated in the, in the places that you would now think of as um, blue states uh, or blue communities. It was celebrated everywhere, red states, purple states, uh, and in all kinds of different ways. Um, my, favorite, my favorite example, one that I write about in the book, was in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, that's about the least likeliest place for an event of this kind. Birmingham in 1970 was notorious uh, for uh, putting doc Dr. King in jail, uh, for using water cannons on peaceful civil rights protesters. Uh, it, it was not considered to be progressive in any way. Uh, and it was also a, a, one of the few industrial cities in the South. It, it had steel plants, it had power, coal burning power plants. So it was one of the most polluted places, but it was also one of the ones that was most dependent uh, on industry. And the South was desperate for industry. Uh, right around the time of Earth Day, uh, the soon-to-be governor of Alabama, George Wallace, uh, said about some new paper mills in the South, you know, that you could smell um, miles and miles away because they were unbelievably noxious. Uh, sure smells good to me. It was jobs. It was prosperity. It was the beginning of a new South. Birmingham had a kick-ass whole week called Right to, right to Live Week focused on air pollution. Uh, and um, the organizers the, were uh, all young people, uh, and one of them who was um, at the medical school as, a, as an intern, um, he ended the week speaking before all the luminaries in town, uh, the Chamber of Commerce executives, uh, the heads of the local universities and community colleges, religious leaders, labor leaders, uh, and really put it to them about the need to get serious about air pollution and got a standing ovation. Uh, and and um, against all odds, uh, one of their goals had been to get this, the state to pass a tough anti-air pollution law. Uh, they had one that passed the year before that most people thought of as, as being actually um, the U.S. Steel law. Uh, 
because it was so weak uh, and took all the pressure off. Uh, but it worked. They did something. And that's only one example. There were, there were all kinds of uh, Earth Day events around the country. Um, in fact, I was looking again at the map. Most of the places, maybe half at least or more that I wrote about, are, are red states now. Um, but they had amazing events in Montana, in Alaska, where the, uh, the pipeline was not yet built and was a big issue on Earth Day. It was really the issue on Earth Day, whether that was going to be good or bad for the state. Um, Albuquerque, New Mexico had a pioneering environmental justice uh, protest in the barrio uh, going from the sewage plant, which is at one part of the barrio, to another part of the, uh, the barrio to demonstrate all the different ways in which the Hispanic community day-to-day uh, -day lived with far worse environmental conditions than anyone else. Um, uh, Miami, Florida uh, had uh, um, a, a group that now they, they'd probably um, be called terrorists, but uh, they, they called themselves Eco Commandos 70. And uh, uh, so they poured dye in the sewage outlets to show where they went offshore and, and how close to shore they were. Um, and uh, and they, they followed that up with a whole series of other um, uh, uh, commando actions that drew attention to all the ways in which uh, the public officials and the companies uh, weren't being honest about uh, where, where waste was going. Um, uh, in Philadelphia, uh, they miraculously won over the Chamber of Commerce. The Chamber of Commerce was going to take out full page, uh, like eight page insert in the newspaper to, to belittle Earth Day, to say how business had a handle on this and it was all being hyped by extremists who were hysterical. Uh, and the organizers of Earth Day in Philadelphia, all these 30-somethings, really uh, talented people, they had a mole, they had someone in the chamber that was upset by this and called them and told them where the meeting was, where they were going to finalize the plans. So they show up unannounced at, the, at this board meeting of the chamber and they say, look, wouldn't you rather spend the money to be part of the solution instead of continuing to be part of the problem? Uh, and they had a very heated exchange that went all night. Uh, but eventually, the, the chamber agreed to donate money to Earth Day in Philadelphia, Earth Week, um, and to host a whole meeting of business leaders and government officials and others in advance of Earth Day to talk about uh, the problems. Uh, and this was at a time when uh, no one really knew, um, in the public at least, how much pollution any individual company was producing. That was proprietary information. Sometimes city officials had it or state officials, but it wasn't public public knowledge. Uh, the Earth Day organizers in Philadelphia said they were going to sue to get that released. Um, and even though they took the money from the chamber, they said they, they wouldn't allow any company that wouldn't acknowledge that it was polluting and how much and what it was going to do um, to get any credit. Uh, that they were going to have a hall of shame for businesses that weren't willing to acknowledge the problem. But they were also willing to acknowledge others uh, that were taking the first steps, even though belatedly, uh, to do something about it. I could go on and on listing types of different Earth Day events. Um, and, and they weren't just uh, um, uh, physical events. There, there were virtual events. So the Today Show, for example, a whole week they devoted to environmental issues. They had never done that to any issue before. So 10, 10 hours of Today Show was devoted to environmental issues. And they had an incredible array of people coming to speak about it. Um, the other thing that I never would have anticipated with Earth Day was how much the day was about public speaking. Uh, that that um, there were all kinds of activities on Earth Day, but the heart of almost every Earth Day celebration was people grappling in public with the issues. And sometimes it was big plenary addresses, sometimes it was panels, sometimes it was um, a whole series of things like that. Uh, but uh, these discussions really were often soul-searching. When the New York Times wrote about one environmental teaching, that's the word that they use, soul-searching. Uh, four days of soul-searching discussion of this environmental crisis. How serious was it? What were its causes? What were the ways that you would need to really deal with it? Were the, were the problems things you could fix easily, or did they require fundamental transformations of society? Uh, how much were you as an individual willing to do uh, what were you willing to change? What might even be exciting to, to do uh, to help solve these problems? 
These are all questions that came up in these, in these discussions, intense discussions on Earth Day. And um, by my estimate, something like 35,000 people at a minimum spoke on Earth Day. Uh, and that, that's phenomenal. There were virtually no environmental experts then. Um, one of the few exceptions, by the way, was a St. Louis, Louisian, um, a very commoner who had uh, uh, spent most of his career at Washington University and had just been on the cover of Time Magazine um, as one of the new eco-prophets, one of the scientists who were, who were uh, preaching about the, the doom that might come if we didn't do something soon. Um, and most of the people that spoke on Earth Day had never spoken publicly about environmental issues before. So they, they really had to think about what they wanted to say, why they cared. And even the people like Commoner, who had spoken often on environmental issues, had never spoken to the s kinds of crowds that they had on, an, on Earth Day. Um, Commoner spoke uh, at a teaching at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor in the basketball arena. Uh, 15,000 people were there. He had never spoken to 15,000 people. No environmentalist had ever spoken to 15,000 people before 1970. Uh, but, 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 uh, uh, and that, that required him to really uh, think in new ways about what he had to say. Uh, and that was true, I think, for, for, the, for all the people who had spoken before. Uh, the crowds not only were bigger, but they were more diverse. Uh, they were more passionate. Uh, and some ended up speaking more prophetically. Some spoke more intimately. Um, Commoner, by the way, in that speech in Ann Arbor, uh, I love this because those of you who, who uh, uh, know the, mu the movie Network will be amazed at this quotation because Network comes a decade after Commoner. Um, but he was incredibly impressed by the young people who had organized the teach-in at, at Ann Arbor. Uh, you have shown us how to take off your, our blindfolds, pull out our earplugs, and shout, we're not going to take it. Uh, that was Commoner speaking to 15,000 people in 1970. Um, and uh, tens of thousands of people organized these events, tens of thousands spoke on Earth Day, millions attended. Uh, and to my surprise, um, and this is the subtitle of the book, I, I discovered that many, many, many of the people that participated in Earth Day uh, many of whom had never particularly cared about environmental issues before, that it wasn't any part of their, their background, uh, decide to devote themselves to it after Earth Day. And, and some continued to do that all the way up to the time that I was writing the book. Their whole life was changed by Earth Day. Uh, many others worked on environmental issues for years or decades before doing something else. Uh, and it hadn't really occurred to me before that, that, that Earth Day created a whole green generation, um, thousands and thousands of people. Uh, and they had to be entrepreneurial in order to make careers in this, uh, in this way. Th there were only a handful of environmental jobs back in 1970. You could be a sanitary engineer. You could design sewers. You, know, you could be a wildlife ecologist and, and you know, make sure there were enough pheasants for the hunters. Um, but there really weren't a lot of jobs yet. And uh, many of the people that participated in Earth Day, uh, they create new kinds of jobs, new ways to make a difference. Um, uh, off the top of my head, one guy, he becomes Mr. River. He spends the whole rest of his life uh, documenting the beauty of America's wild rivers and leading campaigns to, to protect them uh, by speaking and by doing um, coffee table books. Um, uh, People who had interest in traditional fields create a way to do them in an environmental way. So they become environmental lawyers, or they start, if they're professors, they start environmental studies programs, or uh, they become green architects. Uh, or uh, in the media, many people after Earth, they uh, be, have the environment as a beat. They convince their editors that that's important. Um, so not only do you get this first green generation, of people uh, committed to working in this, but, but they also create lasting legacies. And again, th this was something that really surprised me. Um, that, uh, and, and in many cases, the, the lasting legacies grow directly out of the Earth Day effort. Uh, so it, it creates what I call a new eco-infrastructure. Um, 
new lobbying organizations, both nationally and at the state level. Uh, and there's really an explosion of environmental organizations, period. There are more than twice as many in the, by 1973 as there were in 1967, more or less. Um, as I say, newspapers, uh, there had been only literally a handful of environmental writers before Earth Day. Within four months, there were more than 100 newspapers, including the St. Louis uh, Globe Democrat uh, at the time, uh, that now were covering the environment regularly. And a lot of them weren't big papers. They were, they were papers of 7,500 circulation or 15,000 circulation. Um, uh, publishers realize this is a huge, huge thing. One book comes out, uh, rushed into publication in order to, to, to be ready for Earth Day, called the Environmental Handbook. It comes out in January 1970, three months before Earth Day, sells a million copies in paperback. Uh, publishers took notice of that. And uh, a, a year later, uh, uh, someone at the Library of Congress wrote, with exaggeration, but, but still pointing to a real dramatic change, that more books about environmental issues had been published just in the year since Earth Day than all of American history before then. Um, but it's true. A huge number of books come out of all kinds uh, for these new environmental studies classes, for the people who want to figure out what they can do as an individual, um, looks at in-depth looks at issues. Bookstores create uh, environmental sections. Um, to keep alive the spirit of Earth Day, people formed ecology centers. This was a, before the internet uh, that, that you needed to actually physically meet with people in order to network. Uh, and you needed a place to go to find, uh, often in mimeographed form, the latest updates from places around the country that were working on similar issues. These ecology centers, and again, St. Louis had one. Um, they were often the first to do recycling in communities at a time when no governments were doing that. Uh, they often did all kinds of other things, like uh, created organic gardens. Um, some of them were, got involved in politics. Some of them uh, stuck with education. But again, these, these were lasting institutional legacies that come out of Earth Day, and in many cases, directly from the people that participated. Uh, so a lot of the Earth Day organizing was done by um, ad hoc groups that form just for that purpose, and then they decide to stay in business after Earth Day. Uh, they, they decide that they're going to continue, uh, and, and they do, and many of them are st still around today. So Earth Day creates this whole green generation of people entrepreneurially trying to figure out how they can continue to work on these issues, creates all these new institutions that ensure that Earth Day didn't become a fad and that the environmental movement didn't become a fad. That was a word that people used a lot. Uh, th and there were a lot of people that were hoping that it would be a fad, that it would go away. Uh, but thanks to um, these lobbying groups and the press and the books and the ecology centers, uh, uh, all of that, the environmental education programs, um, helped to ensure that, that Earth Day led to lasting change. So. Um, I want to br briefly consider how this happened, because I, I think, uh, for me, that's the, in some ways the most inspiring part of the story. And, and it's, it's really two stories uh, that I, I'll tell briefly, although if you're curious, I, I'll be happy to elaborate in the Q&A time. Uh, so one is a story of a really different kind of political leadership, um, and uh, unbelievably rare, but powerful. Um, uh, and, it, you know, we normally think of leaders, uh, you know, the buck stops here, um, to use another Missourian uh, uh, as an example. Uh, so the, the leader, whether it's a president or someone else who's going to make the tough decisions, uh, I'm the decider if I want to be bipartisan, that's a Republican president. Um, uh, or we think about people in, in back rooms uh, wheeling and dealing uh, in order to get things done. Uh, Gaylord Nelson was neither of those. Uh, Gaylord Nelson's genius was finding a way to lead by empowering other people to be leaders. Um, and he had tried a whole bunch of other things. This in itself is inspiring to me. He just never gave up. Uh, so he became senator. He was elected in 62, starts serving in January 63. And he had decided when he went to Washington, he had been governor of Wisconsin, that his main issue as a senator was going to be the environment. Um, 
and he was going to try to make that a priority for the country. So he's trying to figure out how to do that. His first effort, he thinks, okay, who's the most powerful person in the world? The president. So he writes a letter to JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and says, uh, why don't you go and make a conservation tour of the country? That's what people called environmentalism then, conservation. Um, and if you do that, you know, you get tremendous coverage and all these issues will suddenly be uh, in the public eye and that would be great. And Kennedy agrees to do this, even though he uh, really wasn't passionate about environmental issues. Uh, and it, it's a bust. Um, everywhere he could, Kennedy changed the subject. He was far more interested in the Cold War uh, or the economy. Uh, he didn't get a big crowds in some of these places. And the media also changed the subject wherever they could. There, were, there was no one hardly in the media that knew anything about conservation issues. So Nelson says, okay, president, failure. Uh, maybe Congress. So he starts introducing all kinds of legislation in Congress, you know, to deal with water pollution and to ban DDT and to clean up the Great Lakes. Uh, and there was no C-SPAN then, but uh, I remember in the early days of C-SPAN, if you watched, um, you'd see these speeches, but actually the hall was empty. Uh, the politician was just speaking to the camera. And that's kind of how I envisioned Gaylord Nelson when he would be introducing all these legislation. Um, no one cared, no one listened, none of his laws passed. Uh, and then he, he has this idea for the teaching uh, as he's flying back from going to see the Santa Barbara oil spill. And he thinks, okay, Congress can't do it, President can't do it, maybe young people can do it. Um, but at the time, you know, he, he was slightly younger than me, although he had way less hair. Um, balding figure, pillar of the establishment. Uh, how does a guy like that become the inspiration for the greatest demonstration uh, of, of all time, maybe, in the U.S., uh, and especially one led by young people? Uh, so he, he didn't know, really, how to organize this thing. Uh, he asked a friend, um, a political operative who had worked for John Kennedy and then Robert Kennedy, but who also had experience in education as a, a region or whatever the people are in charge of the University of California system are called. Uh, and so that guy created a, like a 16-page prospectus of how Gaylord Nelson could organize a national teaching. And it was totally top-down. Um, Nelson was going to handpick which schools celebrated and, you know, go to each of them and, and you know, audition the people that would organize it uh, and create a roster of speakers and of media and, you know, a, a list of kinds of events that you could do. Um, Nelson's great idea was not to do that at all. Uh, he, he took some of the small ideas from the operative, uh, but in the big picture, he said, nope, I, I am not going to micromanage this, uh, or to, to use more recent language. Even though this was his child, he wasn't going to be a helicopter parent. Uh, so he was willing to let anyone who wanted to organize a teaching do it, wherever they wanted to do it, uh, and, and it could be any kind of event. He wasn't going to have any control over that. He was confident that if people got together to talk about this, uh, and do whatever else they wanted to do, that it would lead to action, that it would make people realize the problems were more serious than they thought and they needed to do more than they'd ever done before. Uh, and that turned out to be genius because it really did allow tens of thousands of people to take ownership of the event. And that's the second, the second total surprise to me was uh, how many people really devoted months to being Earth Day organizers. Uh, I spoke to somebody, I, I, I interviewed about 120 people who were in, in one way or another involved in the creation of Earth Day. One of them was from St. Louis, Dorothy Sluicer. Um, and uh, she called herself at the time a housewife. Her husband was a professor at one of the theology seminaries in town. Uh, but she was paying attention to these issues. She ultimately wrote a book with her husband about technology and the environment a couple years after Earth Day. She spent months and months on Earth Day. Uh, and, and she had kids, and that was their tough luck. She was just preoccupied with Earth Day. Uh, and I found that that happened again and again and again. People heard about it in December or January, and they started working on it, and it took over their lives. Uh, 
and it became an inc profound educational experience for many of them. Uh, that many had never thought about these issues. Now they have to think about all these complex questions. No one had ever done an Earth Day before. You know, what is an Earth Day? What are the events that you're going to talk about? What, you know, who, what's your goal? Is it to, to push forward a particular agenda or to involve as many people as possible uh, or to bring people together uh, to try to talk uh, uh, despite their differences? Um, was it going to be a celebration? Was it going to be a protest? Was it going to be uh, more of an educational event? The organizers had to think about all these questions. And for many of them, uh, th they learned an incredible amount, not just about the issues. They, they, they not, not only got a holistic sense of uh, the environmental crisis, but they made contacts. They developed skills that were useful in all kinds of ways. They developed confidence. And because there were so few experts in this area, even if you were 20-something, uh, you could very quickly skip what would now be many, many rungs in the occupational hierarchy. You could go out and publish books with major trade presses or um, head, you know, new government agencies as 20-somethings um, uh, with your Earth Day experience. So the experience of organizing Earth Day was this gargantuan do-it-yourself event. Uh, and it was transformative for many people. Uh, and I think the, the education itself is uh, underappreciated as well. Uh, that, that um, uh, and even I didn't understand this when I first started thinking about Earth Day. I knew that it had empowered people, but I didn't realize that part of the empowerment came through asking all these questions. Uh, and from working through the answers practically, uh, that that um, uh, you know we don't really change without learning something, uh, and often the, the the hardest won lessons are the most transformative, and I I think a lot of people um, came out of these three or four months feeling like uh, this was the most intense and exciting period of their life, uh, and that was true even for the older Earth Day organizers not just the 20-somethings and the teenagers. Um, but uh, I, you know, I remember one person I talked to said he woke up the next morning and it, it, you know, he, he had this sort of postpartum depression uh, that, that this had been so interesting and he had to figure out something that would be equally important um, to keep doing, and he did. He became uh, one of the first generation of, of, of scientist activists working for the new um, uh, science-based environmental organizations like the National Resource Defense Council. Um, but I, I think uh, the educational process itself was transformative. And uh, I want to I, I wanna end by giving you one example. Um, uh, at the end of my book, I profile four people, I could have picked many others, whose lives were changed by Earth Day. Um, and they all were changed in quite different ways. Um, but uh, this is the story of Dorothy Bradley uh, in Montana. And one of the fun things about, about uh, giving a talk is occasionally actually reading from the book. Um, Dorothy Bradley decided on Earth Day to seek election to the Montana House of Representatives. She was just a year out of college, and she had never imagined running for political office. She hadn't even intended to stay in Montana. She was planning to do graduate work in environmental studies at the University of Wisconsin, which was one of the few places you could do that then. But she had begun to build a reputation as an activist. Earlier that year, she helped to found the Bozeman Environmental Task Force. She also helped to organize Bozeman's Earth Day celebration. At a party for Earth Day organizers and speakers that night, a leader of the state legal women voters suggested that Bradley run for a seat in the legislature. A state senator seconded the suggestion. Bradley had three strikes against her, the senator said. She was only 23. She was a woman seeking to enter a man's world, and she was a Democrat in a Republican county. But what did she have to lose? And actually, she had to decide that night, because the deadline to register was the next day and I don't remember which town it was in, in Montana that, that she had to go to register, Helena, somewhere hundreds of miles away. So she had to drive all day 
And uh, it happened that there was a photographer there when she arrived, and she's in her ponytails and uh, her jeans and registering to run for state house of representatives. Like many young Americans in 1970, Bradley was not sure that the political system worked, but she saw her campaign as a way to sustain the spirit of Earth Day. She wanted to raise fundamental questions about our relationship to the environment. Her spiritual platform, she said, was Aldo Leopold's A Sand County Almanac. I don't think people should be allowed to abuse the land any more than they're allowed to abuse their children, she argued. The morals of a community should extend to the whole land. Bradley also wanted to advance a practical agenda. She was especially keen to promote a statewide zoning law to give public officials more power to control land use. Bradley's campaign fit her beliefs. Uh, she raised money holding a garage sale. Instead of buying campaign signs and billboard space, she gave away litter bags that people could put in their cars. Uh, and, and the first line was meant to make you laugh out loud. In huge, huge letters, Dorothy is for the birds, much smaller letters, and the elk, and the bears, and the flowers, and for Montana. That was one side. Uh, the other side said, to keep Montana b beautiful, it's up to you. And that bag then had a checklist for action, which was really unusual. Um, carpool or bike, wash with low phosphate detergents, avoid DDT. From the first, Bradley's candidacy caused a stir. Some observers dismissed her as a glib hippie kid. Some Democratic Party officials thought her speeches were too intellectual. But she had strong support in the Montana State University community, and she also appealed to hunting and fishing enthusiasts. And when she won, she argued that her victory was a sign of the timeliness of her agenda. I said everything I felt like saying, she said, that people were ready for a strong environmental pitch. And I, I should add, I didn't mention this in the book, but I found out about this when I was looking through Gaylord Nelson's papers. And she sent a letter to Gaylord Nelson after she wins saying, you were my inspiration. I, I wouldn't be going to the House of Representatives without you. And he wrote back a very uh, wonderful note to her as well. In her first term, Bradley was the only woman in the 105-member House of Representatives. She was also one of the youngest legislators in Montana history. But she quickly earned the respect of colleagues in both parties. Though she spoke for a cause, she never wasted time on symbolic gestures. She had ability and courage, people said at the end of the session. And she, in turn, came to appreciate that political leadership was not black and white, uh, that she came to admire politicians who were, uh, although they had to cater to interest groups, often willing to act independently and then try to convince the voters that they were right. Her grit and unexpected maturity were even more evident in her second term. A coal boom was beginning to transform Montana, very much like the fracking boom um, in uh, uh, eastern United States right now, um, or North Dakota, the oil boom. She feared that this boom would destroy the state's quality of life. In addition to new strip mines, the explosive growth of the coal industry promised to mean perhaps 20 new power plants. One of her supporters said that the powers that be were trying very hard to turn Montana into the boiler room of the nation. So she proposed a moratorium on coal development. Before the state made possibly irreversible decisions, she argued, policymakers needed a chance to study the many issues the boom would bring to the fore. What should the state do to pre prevent strip mine wastelands? How should the state determine where power plants and transmission lines could go? What should the state do to control air pollution and protect groundwater? How should the state balance agricultural and industrial interests? The moratorium seemed to have no chance. Uh, and that's how the newspapers all described it when she w introduced the bill. But the House approved the measure by one vote after a passionate all-night debate. Then the pro-development forces counterattacked, and two days later, they convinced one guy to change his vote, and the moratorium was overturned. Um, but Bradley had impressed the Speaker of the House uh, with the seriousness of the issue, and he promised to revive the moratorium as a stick, uh, that if legislatures did not pass tough laws to protect the environment before the end of the session, the Speaker was going to reintroduce the moratorium on the last day, and if it passed, then it was law. It couldn't be overturned. There would be a moratorium. 
That stick worked. The legislature approved measures to address strip mine reclamation, power plant siting, and other critical needs. Bradley ultimately served eight terms in the legislature. Uh, she ran for governor, lost by a couple thousand votes. If she had won, she would have been the first governor in Montana history. Um, and instead, she returned to environmental work. She directed the Montana Water Center for a decade, and she still is grateful to have been able to help try to build an enduring land ethic in her state. I always felt lucky, she said in 2008 when I talked with her. My career never would have happened without Earth Day. And for me, stories like that are incredibly inspiring, and even more so now um, when we need more and more people than ever before who are committed and ready to make a difference. Thank you.